Hi, I'm Tintin Wisniewski from the Hoover Institution. Hoover's Corette Task Force on K-12 Education, with the help of some friends, has attempted to project what American education might look like in the year 2030. By that time, today's newborn will become college freshmen. The task of looking so far ahead while fre refreshing is also quite formidable. We invite you to join us in this predictive video presentation in search for solutions to the challenges that American education faces in the years ahead. For more information about this project, please visit our website at AmericanEducation2030.com. Eric Hanushek is the Paul and Jean Hanna Senior Fellow in Education at the Hoover Institution, where he specializes in the economics of education and applied public finance. He shows how changes in assessment and the data resulting from them will be productively applied to boosting student performance. Education looks like a world of fads, or at least it did in the past. In much of the 20th century and into the 21st century, Ideas for changing schools came from somebody just having a good idea, and it was introduced into many schools, often with derision for schools that didn't introduce these fads. But these fads were not chosen in any systematic way, so school performance didn't really improve. And in fact, the only procedures for removing the last fad was that a new fad came along, and it became the modern reform idea. The new, new ideas were not necessarily any better than the old, and so no improvement was seen. But the world of 2030 is oddly different, because now we have a procedure for deciding which programs and policies to keep and which to leave, and it, there's a simple explanation for this. One of the fads at the turn of the century was to develop information on performance and use that in school management. And this innovation actually changed the way schools operated and eliminated the old fad cycle. Businesses had long used information on performance to make decisions about their management and what uh, policies they wanted to introduce. But this was oddly not used in schools which were insulated from those ideas. That is the case until the standards and accountability movement came along at about the beginning of the 20th century. And what this did was to provide performance information that could be used in the same way that businesses used performance information. But it wasn't introduced very easily. There was a lot of debate about this, some of it legitimate, others not. Uh, by 2030, though, it is the mode of policy making to use performance information. What changed? Well, the initial concern was not so much about having standards, but by about the tests themselves and how the tests were being used. In particular, school personnel did not like the idea of being measured by the performance of their students, and they resisted this along with teachers' unions. But the debate about testing, in fact, um, uh, took a, a different turn when everybody recognized that, in fact, our students were not competitive internationally. And added to that, parents really liked the idea of having performance information. One of the big changes was how we looked at testing and accountability. Under the federal No Child Left Behind standard, we had uh, a measure of all students being proficient in a school. But we saw that suburban schools systematically did better. And there was a reason for that. Systematically, kids in suburban schools came better prepared to class on average than those in urban schools. We could never, however, tell whether it was the families or the schools who were making the difference. With added accountability information, we could trace student performance over time, and that allowed us to make some distinctions. There were still a lot of political issues that had to be dealt with, but recognizing that we had to do something about the international competitiveness, competitiveness of our students led to some major changes and broke down the resistance. We also improved testing. 
we went to adaptive testing, which allowed us to test a much wider range of performance by using a computerized test that first gave a signal of what level of difficulty students should uh, be given in their testing. We uh, could test suburban students along with proficient students and so forth. Uh, with the expansion of testing, testing questions became much better and became much more open so that teachers legitimately in an educationally uh, useful way taught to the test. Um, we also dropped the term proficient because we recognized that we wanted all students to develop even past a basic level. What have been the results by 2030 of this system? Well, student performance has improved. And while Hong Kong and Finland and Canada still remain ahead of us on international math and science tests, we've managed to close about half of the gap with them. On the other side, achievement gaps within our country have not narrowed all that much. We have gaps by income and race that have persisted because everybody has gotten better, but the gaps have not closed. 